Guten Willweil haben. That's a German saying telling you that sometimes you just ought to be patient. And patient are wars. Always looking around, trying to make the impossible happening, like acquiring this high screen Kalani tower of the mid 90s. It's over a year ago that I was doing that video about Vobis, the high screen household brand and Luigi Colani providing the designs to Vobis and me mourning about the condition that I was giving one of these away back in the days, not knowing what treasure I had. Retro computing is the use of all the computer hardware and software in modern times. I'm the vintage collector and these are my stories. This episode is sponsored by PCBWay.com, your source for CNC machining, 3D printing, PCBs and more. If only I hadn't thrown it away in the years between. And ever since I made my last video about German retailer Vobis and their mid-90s collaboration with designer Luigi Colani, I was looking around to also acquire one of the Colani designed PC towers. Although they every so often appear on eBay, prices are typically astronomic, so I just sat there and waited. And I waited for almost two years until I came round one reasonably priced eBay offering, which eventually arrived with me, neatly packed and fully intact. Now, this is the second revision design of the Kalani Tower, featuring a hinge door covering up the drive base. This particular design appeared later through the course of 1993 and was significantly different from the previous tower and desktop design seen earlier that year. I can only guesswork, but most likely the custom front faces for the drive base were too expensive and cumbersome to produce, especially for the newly appearing CD-ROM drives and other third-party 5 1/4 inch devices, calling for a more simplified design. Of course, I'd love to also get hold of the original Colon designed PC tower at some point, but for the time being I was decidedly looking for this second revision. Because this very machine is of the same make like the one my dad bought in 1993, sporting the original Intel Pentium CPU. Now, speaking of the hinge door, here we get to see already the first imperfection of this machine, as when I'm removing the door, it becomes loose because one of the hinges is broken. In addition to that, it's missing the side cover panel and one of the drive bay covers as well. And while it was clearly stated on the eBay description, these imperfections are clearly the reason for the low price. On the other side, it still has the original main board in it and the original Sony CDU 31A CD-ROM drive, yet even the floppy drive is the original one. The question is of course, will it still turn on? And so it turns on and of course the usual dead CMOS battery ain't far away, also manifesting itself with a weird date and time display in the BIOS setup. And although the front panel indicates it's a 60 MHz machine, the BIOS reports a 66 MHz Intel Pentium. Fair enough. So what about the floppy drive? Will it still work? Apparently it does. Although it wouldn't have been a big deal, as I happened to find just this very floppy drive, also in working condition, on an earlier occasion already, so I would have a spare one. This is as important as the front face is custom tailored so you can swap in just any random 3.5 inch drive. But I'm happy I don't need to bother about it at all. Also, Norton System Info equates this CPU as a 66 MHz one, providing also accurate performance reading. Maybe that machine saw the CPU swapped at some point. And here goes my brief mention on today's episode sponsor PCB Way, who I have worked with on several projects already featured on this channel. PCB Way is offering you a wide range of services around CNC machining, PCB production including full assembly services and 3D printing. For any project you publish to the PCB Way Maker community, you'll get a 10% kickback on production cost if it's picked up by someone else. Use the link in the video description below to join up with PCB Way and claim your free $5 welcome voucher. As usual, I'm giving the thing some cleaning. I'm also removing the base plate as I have to fix a breakage there. 
As noted, this machine comes with the Sony CDU31A CD-ROM drive, which used a proprietary adapter card. I'll be covering that one in a separate follow-up video. As far as it goes, I have to re-glue that mounting bracket. Also, the broken hinge needs some fixing. The frame of the power switch also has some broken off part that I'm re-sculpting. For the base plate, I'm injecting some clips to reinforce the structure. I'm using the soldering iron to wield the plastic, but I'm going to add the two components plastics glue as well to fill in the grooves. In a previous video, I've shown how I open up an RTC chip to wire up an external battery. Now, that ain't proper fixing, so here I got myself a modern reproduction, which features an outside accessible battery socket. As it doesn't have a proper marking for the mounting orientation, I'll mark it myself so I won't accidentally put it in the wrong way round. Now, as the original RTC chip is soldered on, I first have to desolder it from the main board. No big deal after all, and it's nice to see it all works fine after this procedure. As this machine didn't come with a hard drive, I took this one from my stock. It's a 426 MB Western Digital Drive, the same capacity as my dad originally had in this machine. Now, the bad thing is, even though I had this drive tested on another machine before, it totally wouldn't work at all in this one. Even with the bias detecting it, MS-DOS would always complain for failing on the hard drive. So I went with yet another one with 540 MB of capacity, which then worked flawlessly. Now, I won't bother for the missing drive bay cover for the moment, as I'm trying to get a hold of a removable drive bay exactly the way it was installed back then. This machine sports a Sandblast Vibra 16 and the aforementioned custom CD-ROM controller for the Sony CDU31A drive. As I don't have a matching audio cable that would fit both the drive and the sound card, I have to make some magic here and solder the connectors across, as I definitely want the audio to go via the sound card and not via the custom drive controller. That eventually brings me to the tedious task of the internal cable management. As much as I hate loose cables, as much I hate doing the cabling. Especially the ribbon cables were never my friends, but eventually everything looks neat and tidy. But I'm not there yet. I still have to do something about that missing side cover. No way am I going to recreate the sheet metal cover, but I'm also not letting this machine sit open. So I go with an acrylic glass cover that I'm cutting to fit. To hold it in place, I'll glue on some neodymium magnets, which are strong enough to hold the weight of the acrylic glass. This way, it's still covered up and looks nice until I eventually come along a suitable cover. As I want this machine to be prominently featured in my room of requirement, I'm equipping another flat panel display with a visa mount that goes along with my freshly revamped display setup. So long for my restoration on this rare high screen Kalani tower of 1994. Let me know in the comments below what you think about it. I'm happy to go into discussions. And as you saw, it gained its place of honors here in my room of requirements. Now I'm ready for the next endeavors, which is to install a multi-boot setup using MS-DOS, Windows 3.1 and RBM OS 2. But that's another story. I'm the Vintage Collector and this was the story for today. Thanks for watching and see you again next Sunday.